Well, good evening. It's a joy to be with you again and to share in these lessons. Share in these lessons. Fellowship, our word that we're looking at. And I appreciate, uh, appreciate very much Chris's enthusiasm for these lessons and the rest of you who have offered comments and thoughts that these things are helping you to see what I hoped you would see, that this subject of koinonia or fellowship is really much broader, much deeper than most of us think. Um, it, is, it is a powerful, powerful tool for God to make the body magnify him as we sang this evening and to glorify him as we sang this evening. Very appropriate songs and prayers tonight. Thank you, brothers, for all that you're doing to bring us to this point. Well, if we're a community of believers, and if we're a family of God, and if we're members of the same body, then it stands to reason that we feel obligations toward each other, that we don't stand alone as individuals, that we are moving together like members of the body move together. And I, I'm sorry if you feel you've made that point, you don't need to make it again, but I think it really emphasizes my body parts didn't get out of bed individually this morning. And the feet said, okay, we'll go, where, where you wanna to go today? And the fingers didn't crawl out from under the sheets and say, where's the hand, we'll attach, we're with you. Um, we're ready to point tonight if you need us to do that. The body just moved together. And oh, that we could have that kind of synchronicity, that kind of harmony with each other. You know, the kind of harmony we have when we sing together. It, it, I don't know if you think about that, but a song leader gets up and blows a pitch and everybody automatically hears that and we're ready to start and then gives us that pitch and then the hand comes down and we're all together. We're together on that. We sing our parts when we're supposed to sing them. And it makes for a beautiful melody, a beautiful harmony and beautiful synchronicity for God. For God, I mean, he, I think he hears that and says, that's wonderful. Not because it was beautiful four-part harmony, but because it's the united effort of his people. Whether we sang in unison or sang in harmony, it gives glory to God because it unifies his people. That's not just the way we need to sing. That's the way we need to live. And that's not just when we come together. It's deeper than that. It's broader than that. It's wider than that. So I'm, I'm calling you to that again and again. And tonight in particular, I want to talk to you about sharing possessions. Now you're, you're sitting on your wallets. You can continue to sit on them. It's not my intent this evening to get you to give up anything to me or make any kind of special contribution tonight. If you're a guest and visiting, it's not what we're about here. But I do want you to think about how your possessions really become, in large part, the property and the tool of the body of Christ. So, <clears throat> it was that way in the first century. I'm going to read some passages, and I'm going to invite you to turn and read those with me for two reasons. First of all, I want you to see these passages. I'm going to begin in Romans 15. I mean, Romans 12. I'm giving you a head start. Go ahead and get over there. But I'm telling you, I want you to read these because not only do I want you to see the passage itself, the passages that we're going to look at, but I want you to be looking because now I hope your eyes and your ears are starting to be trained to hear our word koinonia, koinonia, as we look at it in the scriptures. We've already talked about how it's translated in many ways. I want you to see if you can find it in the passages that we're looking at here. So I begin in Romans 12 and we're gonna move through our New Testament with several passages. So each one will be to the right in your Bibles of the ones that we were at before. Or if you're scrolling 
and your devices, it'll be underneath them. Okay? Romans chapter 12 and verse 13. Contributing to the needs of the saints. Practicing hospitality. Now go to chapter 15. <clears throat> and look at verses 26 and 27. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so. And they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. <clears throat> I'll begin in verse 3 because that's the beginning of the thought. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of, of participation in the support of the saints. Man, oh, listen, I wish we could just stay on that verse all night. Not going to, but that is one powerful verse. I will come back and touch it again in the, in the course of our study. Chapter 9, verse 13. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 13. Because of the proof given by this ministry... They will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. Two more passages. I'm in 1 Timothy. Go over there if you would, please. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. And finally, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 16 <clears throat> and do not <clears throat> neglect doing good and sharing for with such sacrifices God is pleased with such sacrifices God is pleased now I told you those verses have something in common first of all all of those verses are about sharing financial resources all of them and secondly all of those verses have our word koinonia in them. The word that's on the slide behind me, that word is found in every single one of those verses. It's found in words such as sharing. It's found in participating. It is found in contributing. Those are variants of our word koinonia. We're talking tonight about fellowship. But it's deeper than fellowship. It's not just fellowship the way we typically think of it. That's a great thing. You're my brother. You're my sister. I'm your brother. I'm your sister. We have family together. That's fellowship. But this is talking about a particular mark of being part of the family of God. This is what koinonia looks like. Sharing is an act of of obedience. I, I, want you to, I want you to think about this. It is commanded, not suggested. The passages that we just looked at, I'm not going back through all of them, but those passages are not saying you might want to think about, or if you have an opportunity, or if you have financial windfalls that you're willing to share with others. 
not one of those passages had an if clause in them. Not one of those passages listed a conditional command. Every one of those said, you do it. You do this. And they said it even in terms of not just you share, but you be ready to share. You ever thought about that? Be ready to share. When I lived in, I lived in Mississippi and I loved an expression. There were a lot of expressions I loved there. Great expressions. Mississippians know how to turn a phrase. I remember on one occasion uh, asking a guy, I said, hey, would you mind, would you mind if I borrow your hose? And he said, hey, as long as I got a biscuit, you got half. I thought, isn't that a great expression? That great. That had nothing to do with this lesson, but I just thought you might want to use that. But they had another expression. People would say things. I would say, hey, we ought to go get breakfast tomorrow. And the other guy would say, I'm sitting on ready. Sitting on ready. Some of y'all have heard that expression? Y'all use that? See, it's a great expression because what it says is, I'm not just going to do it. I'm eager to do it. I am sitting on ready to jump and do that. God is calling us to be sitting on ready to help other people. To do something with our resources. Regarding our relationship to each other in the family of God. Sitting on ready. He wants us to be ready to do that. Go back and look at a couple of these passages, just a couple of them. Back there in Romans chapter 15. I, I want you to listen to the terminology now with what I'm talking about in mind. Yes, <clears throat> he says, they were pleased to do so. He's talking about the contribution that Macedonia and Achaia made for the saints at Jerusalem. He says they were pleased to do so. Are, are you always pleased to share your financial resources? Because there are times when I will tell you, I'm not always pleased to do that. And I think there are times, there are circumstances in which it's okay to not be pleased. But when it comes to the kind of sharing of our possessions we're talking about tonight, being pleased to do so is important. So here's the difference. It's the difference in somebody coming to you and saying, hey, I, I really need some help. Um, I blew a tire and it's, it's bald and I can't even, I don't have the money to replace it. I can't even repair it. Is there any way you can help me? There is a major difference in this. How much? And in this, yeah, sure. I'm glad you asked me. Yeah, how much you need? You see the difference in those? If you didn't see the difference in that, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> the guys in the splash zone down here got it. They nodded their heads. There's a difference. Being eager, ready, ready to do that. They were pleased to do so. Why? Listen now to this phrase. They are indebted to them. They're indebted to them. In what way? In what way? Had the people in Jerusalem given financial resources to Macedonia and Achaia before? You know, in Florida, like you have here in Texas, we're sometimes beset by hurricanes. We got a, we got a one-two punch this past year. I mean, the hurricane came in on the West Coast and nailed us, and then it came in on the East Coast and nailed us. And some of the people who were helped in those hurricanes were helped by people in our area who said, I know what it's like to lose your house. I, I was there and somebody helped me. I want to help those people down there. That's the kind of indebtedness that we typically think of. But these people weren't indebted to them 
because they had been helped financially. They were indebted to them because they were spiritually tied to them. These people owed their spiritual welfare, the people in Macedonia and Achaia, to those saints in Jerusalem who had brought them the gospel. Now, in a family of God like this, we have an indebtedness to each other because of our relationship spiritually. It's not a matter of, well, sure, I'll help you because when my tire was blown and bald, you helped me get a new tire. It's not that kind of thing at all. But listen again to the word, indebted. God really puts the pressure. When you're in debt to somebody, do you have the option to pay? No. You're what? Obligated to pay. It's not an option. It's an obligation. Now listen to me. That's what we're talking about here tonight. Not a free will offering if I choose to do it or not do it, but an obligatory reaction to the needs of my brothers and sisters. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13. The passage that we looked at there. I want you to hear this wording again. I'm, I'm bearing down on this because I think it's important for us to get the proper mindset about this. Verse 13, because of the proof of this ministry, they will glorify God for your what? Your obedience to your confession of the gospel and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. That word contribution is our word, you're sharing with them. The point that he makes here is giving is an act of obedience. God is telling us to do that, not suggesting it. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18, one of the last passages we read, remember Paul tells Timothy, what? suggest to them to be generous and ready to share? Mm -mm. It's not suggest. Encourage them. Give them an example. No. Instruct them. Instruct them. Instruction doesn't leave a lot of optional room. Instruct them to be generous and ready to share. So let me suggest on this point that giving or sharing is not something we do because we feel like it. Or we do it because we feel good when we do it. But it is something that is prompted by our love. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? How, how can you say the love of God is in you? How can I say the love of God is in me if we see brethren in need and do not act to meet those needs? That's a rhetorical question, the answer of which is you can't. You can't. May I put it bluntly? I don't, think I'm, I don't think I'm abusing the passage at all to say bluntly. You can't claim to love like God if you aren't taking care of your brethren. You can't. And so it, it's commanded. But secondly, the needs of others actually become our needs. Because again, remember, remember our illustration? You know, one part of my body hurts. I get hit in the forehead. What happens? Immediately my hands grab my forehead. My eyes start blinking. They're making sure I'm okay. We're looking around. We, we may sit down. Hey, let's sit down and get ourselves together. And get, All of my body reacts because it's not just my forehead. It's Ralph's body that's at stake. The needs of others actually become our needs. That passage again in Romans chapter 12. We're, we're, we're looking at it one more time. Romans chapter 12, verse 13, contributing that, and by the way, that word contributing there is a variant of our word koinonia, sharing in the needs of the saints. 
It is sharing in it. It's participating in it. It becomes mine. It says we're to identify ourselves with the needs of others and make them our own. If I got a biscuit, you got half. Because you're my brother or you're my sister. And your needs become my needs. We're members of the same body. I want you to think about this. Wouldn't it be a really cruel family if they all sat down to eat a big Thanksgiving dinner and one member of the family was overlooked in all of the food and nobody passed the food to that individual? Nobody. And they sat there hungry while everybody ate around them. Wouldn't that be a ridiculous picture of a family? Wouldn't we call such a family dysfunctional? So how can we possibly overlook the needs of brethren when those needs become apparent to us? I, I love this statement. I love the way this is worded because it says something about the hearts of the New Testament church. In Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, verse 32 says this, and the congregation of those who believed, the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. Now, I'm, I'm going to suggest to you, I don't believe that's an absolute statement. I don't think everybody said, sure, you want my clothes, you can have them. You want my kids, they're yours. Whatever I got, yours. You can move into my house, take up a residence here. I don't mean that absolutely everything, but the, the intent and the thrust of the New Testament church was this. They were of one heart and soul. One heart, one heart, one soul. And they said, if I got it and you need it, of course I'll share it. Of course I will. Why? Why? Because they just happened to be generous people? No, because they were one heart and soul. They were one body. They understood that relationship. And, and 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the first two verses, which talk about our giving on the first day of the week, it tells us that we're to help others. It specifically talks in terms of a contribution that was going to be made for saints in another area. And, and in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28... We're shown that same kind of thinking individually. I love this passage because it's such a challenge. Before I read it and before you put your eyes on it, think about this. <clears throat> Young people will often say, I can't wait till I'm old enough to get a job. And I'll say, why do you want a job? They said, so I can earn money. Why do you want to earn money? So I can buy things. What kind of things do you want to buy? And then it comes, well, I can buy games or a gaming system, or I can buy a car, or I can buy clothes. I can buy my own clothes. I can buy food when I want it, where I want it. I can buy those things. And all those things have one thing in common, only one thing in common. They're all for me. But I'm going to tell you something, young people. If you want the heart of Christ, change your thinking tonight. Change it tonight. Because here's what God said. Ephesians 4, verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer. But rather, he must labor performing with his own hands what is good. So stop there. He has to get a job. You need to get a job so that you can earn money. For what purpose, Paul? 
so that he will have something to share with one who has need. That is so indicting. Now, how many of us are thinking that way, folks? I struggle with that. I, I get a, I, I pay my taxes and then I find out, hey, I'm getting a big rebate this year. What are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with the rebate? Hey, let's take a cruise. Let's take a trip. Hey, let's get that car fixed. Hey, let's add on to the house. Let's get a refrigerator. Or if your rebates are a lot like mine, let's go to Dairy Queen. No, we're going to blow it. All of it. One night at Dairy Queen. Wouldn't it be amazing if the way we thought about those kinds of things was this? We got a windfall. I mean, we didn't expect that money. Who needs it? Who could use some help? Who could use that? Wouldn't it be, and wouldn't it be wonderful if, if the money just kind of flowed from person to person until it found a stopping point? You know, I mean, suppose, suppose I took it and, and I gave it to Brother Leon and I said, we got some extra money, Brother Leon. You need it here. Have $100. Do what you need with it. You might need it. And he said, I don't need it. Well, then pass it on. Give it to somebody else. He gives it to somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. And then suddenly one person says, $100. It's just what I needed. Wouldn't it be wonderful if our surpluses flowed like that around the congregation of God's people? Just taking the chance it'll land somewhere where it's needed. So that he will have something to share with one who has need. Sharing is an act of joy. There is a great joy in sharing. Back at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. <clears throat> I told you I'd come back here. They gave of their own accord in verse 3. First of all, they didn't have to be told. They didn't have to be told. Now, I know already tonight we're kind of violating that because we are talking about it. And I am telling you these, this needs to be done by God's people. They didn't have to be told to do that. But listen to the wording. Begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. Wouldn't it be amazing if somebody in the congregation had a big need? Let's just, let's paint it this way. One of the elders comes forward and he says, uh, I need to let all of you know that the Jones family lost their house last night. Everybody gasped. They didn't know that. What happened? Well, it burned. They had an electrical shortage and the house is burned. It's burned to the ground. We, we need some help. Wouldn't it be amazing if the members started elbowing each other out of the way, coming down the aisles to say, let me do it. Let me do it. No, no, no. Uh, I got it. I got this. No, no. We want to help. We want to be involved. We'll take in the Joneses. No, no, no. We got the Joneses. We're taking the Joneses. Okay, we'll take two of the Joneses and you get two of the Joneses. And, and we've, got, we've got cement block at our house. We're going to give it. No, no, no. They want to build a wooden house. We got wood at our house. Wouldn't that be amazing? Listen to this wording. Begging us. Not, oh man. Okay, I'll help. I got an RV. I haven't been using it. The Joneses can stay in the RV. That's not it. It's, oh, please, please, please take our RV for now. Take it. Use it. It's yours. Till you don't need it any longer. It's yours. Begging us with much urging. Oh, come on, Paul. Let us help. Please let us help. Saying to the elders, let us help. Please, 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 please. Oh, pick me. Pick me. Much urging for the favor, not the obligation, not the obligation, the favor. 
Could we do it, please? We'd like to do it. I, I was eating with somebody recently, a, a man, there was a group of us eating, and, and uh, I invited this man to join me with a group of people that were eating together, and I was going to take care of their food because they were my guests, and I said, uh, I've, got, I've got this. And, and this guy said, please, please, would you let me do this? I, I really would like to do this. Would you let me do this? That's, that's, that's hard to say no to. Please, let me do this. The Macedonians were pleading for the chance to help. Why? Why? Do you wonder why? Are they just naturally generous people? Are they born that way? Is it in their DNA or something? Verse 2 gives you the answer. That in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy... And their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. It made them happy. It made them happy. They were joyful about that. In, in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25, it says, And he who waters will himself be watered. Uh, that passage doesn't necessarily and shouldn't be limited to the idea that if you help other people, that when you need help, they'll help you. I think that is true. I do think there's a truth to that. But there's a sense in which helping other people waters your own heart. It just it makes us better. And now I want to say something to all of you people who think like my mother thought when she was alive. My mother was one who would regularly turn away offers to help. Some of us are like that. Some of us are like that. We say to other people when they say, hey, let us, let us bring you something. You're sick. Let us bring you some. No, no, we don't need anything. We don't need, we're good. No, we don't need anything. And that may be true. That may be true. And then again, it may be just a person who just doesn't want to be indebted to anybody else. And I said to my mother, Mom, you're depriving people of the greater blessing. You know that? You're depriving them of the greater blessing. The greater blessing isn't receiving. The greater blessing is giving. I didn't make that up. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So we deprive people of the joy and it should never be done, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, grudgingly. Each one must do as he's purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. Now, I, would, I do want to say something. It's somewhat tangential, but I think it does relate to this. I, I have said this about runners. I'm not a runner. You didn't have to... I didn't have to tell you that. You just had to look at me and know that. I'm not a runner. But I have said for years, I'll take up running when I see somebody running with a smile on their face. Because they all look like they're gasping for their last breath. They just don't look very happy to me. They don't. And I think they're doing penance or something, you know. But I want to tell you something else. There's a part of our worship that just puzzles me because we can talk about this you're not not to give grudgingly for God loves a cheerful giver I don't know when I've seen brethren look more sour and sober than when they're giving we're passing the collection plates and there's not a smile on anybody's face at all cheerful givers so I would just suggest to you you may say, well, Ralph, we're cheerful in our hearts. We're cheerful when we give. Well, to quote that old song and add a verse, if you're happy and you know it, tell your face. <laughs> you know, let me see some people that are smiling when they give. Let me see some people that look happy to be putting that money in the plate. Look happy about that. It not only will say something to God, it'll say something to your family members. It'll say something to the people that are around you. 
that this is a source of joy for you. Now, I'm not going to be here next Sunday, but I hope the guys that pass the plates are looking at you when they pass them. <laughs> and, and maybe, maybe instead of giving till it hurts, maybe we need to give till it feels good. So you guys passing the plate Sunday, if they got a sour look on their face, just keep the plate in front of them. Just <laughs> right there, more. And then when they smile, you can move on to the next person. All right, just try it. See, try it and see if that works. I'm predicting you'll have a lot of smiles or a really big contribution <laughs> or both. Sharing is an act of joy. Finally, last, sharing is an act of glorifying God. It's an act of glorifying God. All right, I, I want to read again 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to begin in verse 11. And I want you to listen to what Paul says is going to happen to the Corinthians when they give this money to help the church at Jerusalem and the saints there who are suffering mightily. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but it's also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof, proof given by this ministry, they'll glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. All right. <clears throat> we become God's instrument to meet the needs of others. We become his tool to take care of others. It's the idea, God gave it to me, I'm just passing it on to you. Doesn't belong to me, I'm just a steward. I'm a steward. So what I got, God's gonna use to help you. Now, I'm gonna give you a really fanciful illustration that I think does say something to us and then we're done with the lesson tonight, all right? I want you to imagine that a Christian is praying fervently for a hundred dollars to pay an electric bill because the electric company has just said we're shutting you off they don't have a job and this person is saying they're going to turn off the power in my house i got kids in the house i can't let this happen god god please will you please just give me a hundred dollars $100 to pay this bill. I'm right around the corner from the electric company. Please, God, please give me the $100. Now, at the time that happens, let's say God hears that prayer, and here's how he chooses to answer it. We're not in the age of miracles, so it's not, poof, and there's a $100 bill in his hand. Not going to make it that simple. But God is providential, and he can work things according to his will, by not violating the free will of others, but just using circumstances. At the time that person's praying that prayer, there's another guy coming out of a bank and he's fairly wealthy and he's asked for 10 $100 bills, fresh new ones to give to all of his grandkids who are coming up for birthdays in the near future. And he comes out and he's counting the $100 bills and you know new $100 bills are pretty tight and he's licking them and separating them. And as he does that, out of his abundance that he has, one of those $100 bills comes out a little much and it starts to slip and a wind comes, a mighty wind that God brings. And the wind takes that $100 bill, it takes it out of the guy's hands, floats it up over a building and it's out of sight. The guy says, I'll never get it back. Goes back in, gets another $100, goes on his way. Meanwhile, the $100 bill comes floating over the building, back over here to the guy who's saying, God, please, please, I need $100. It's right there. He picks it up. He remembers to thank God. And he goes in and pays the bill. That's a cool story. I mean, you'd say, man, God is good. 
He provided for that guy in a wonderful way. And the other guy wasn't really hurt. He had an abundance anyway. And so everybody's taken care of and they go on their way. Good things happen. But now I want you to imagine another scenario. Same guy praying for $100 to pay an electric bill. And about the time that he's in the middle of the prayer, he gets a call from one of the brethren in his congregation. And the and person calls and he picks out the phone and he says, hello. And the guy says, hey, how you doing? He goes, well, not so good. Today's not really going well for me. What's the matter? Well, I hate to say it, but I owe $100 to the electric company. They're going to shut my power off. The other guy says, where are you? Oh, I'm downtown. I'm on the corner of Main and Second. Stay right there. I'll be there. Guy drives over to him, rolls down the window, says, here. He gives him $100. The guy pays the bill. We may like the way God worked in that first one because it's kind of exciting. But I want to suggest to you that second one reaps so many more blessings. So many more blessings. Because the way that second scenario was handled, which is far more likely a scenario, God is going to be thanked because the, per the person was praying and the phone call came and he, and he got his hundred dollars. He's going to thank God. There's going to be joy for the giver. Don't you imagine the guy that gave him the money and saw the look of relief and joy on his face of the other fella is going to go home feeling really good? Don't you know he's going to crank the radio up, turn up his music and enjoy the day because he did something good for somebody else? Do you think there might be a closer relationship between those two as a result of that matter of helping one another? I would suggest that's likely to happen. There's a great object lesson for the recipient. The man who was helped, do you think now he might be more likely when he gets on his feet to help somebody else? And do you think the help might overcome any possibility of greed in the giver? That he's now given up $100 that was his, maybe hard-earned money. Maybe he's not a rich person, but this came hard, but I'm giving it to you because you need it. And he's certainly not going to be greedy if that happens. The selfishness of possessions is not his anymore. You see all the blessings that happen with that? All the good things that come out of that? And I'm going to tell you, folks, that's how God works. That's how God works. God wants us to be the tools. God doesn't want to blow winds of money here, there, and everywhere. He doesn't want to make errors in checking accounts that have to be paid back so that somebody gets some windfall they didn't expect. That's not the way God wants to work. God wants to work through his people who demonstrate the love of God in them. So how much better is it when we are constantly looking for opportunities to help brethren? And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to read one more passage at the very end, but I want to just say this by way of closing this thought. If you are moved by what we're talking about tonight and say, that's the life I need to live and want to live, you need to go to your elders right away and say, help me help others. Just tell me who needs help. And, and if not tonight, when those come up, you put my name on the list. It would be a beautiful example if you did that. And it would be a wonderful result if every shepherd in this congregation had a line of people tonight saying, take my name down. I want to help. That is koinonia. That is living in the body with the people of God. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. And do not neglect doing good and sharing. May I use our word here? Do not neglect doing good and koinonia -ing. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. God 
is pleased. And the only sacrifice I think God is even more pleased by than the things that we're talking about tonight is for somebody in this audience tonight to offer the ultimate sacrifice of your life to Jesus Christ. To the one who gave his life for you, give it up for him. Bring him your every care. Bring him your sins. Bring him your broken life. Bring him your soul and let him make you whole. That's our invitation. If you're ready to respond to it, you come while we stand and sing.